Um, all right, what do we say we get started three minutes early here, and anyone that comes in three minutes late or on time, you guys will have to get them up to speed. Um, uh, also, if anyone knows Jorge Castedo, he has his Drupal badge here. You do? Yes, we have a winner. You get um, a new identity. <laughs> Thank you. I think that was in here from the last session, which apparently got a little crazy and some lanyards were flying around. Um, okay, uh, well welcome everyone uh, to uh, building your DevOps game plan. Um, thank you especially for everyone in the front row. Uh, appreciate, um, appreciate the love. Um, so we're gonna dig in a little bit about um, how you can bring about uh, change to the organization or the team or the group that you're working in um, and uh, get into DevOps a little bit. Um, so we'll just do some quick kind of like hand raising to, to work it out a little bit. So um, how many people here like feel like they know what DevOps is and are excited about it? Yeah, maybe a bunch of people, cool. Um, let's talk a little bit about like the organization size that we work with. So who works in an organization like under 50 people? Not anymore, cool. What about under, um, I'm not sure, 300 people? Um, okay, what about under like 1,000 people? Yeah, so pr pretty, good, pretty good distribution. Um, uh, my background is mostly kind of at smaller companies, um, startups and um, kind of mid-sized tech firms, um, but hopefully what, uh, what we get into today will be applicable um, across the board. So I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, so my name is Nick Stilau. Um, I do engineering at Pantheon as one of the first uh, handful of hires there. So if, you, um, if you're if you using Pantheon at all, which I would recommend, you're probably using some, you know, some software system that I built. If you're using Pantheon and it's working really well, you're almost certainly using um, some software which an engineer uh, that's on the team now gutted out all my code and replaced it with much better working code. Um, I'm at nsteelau on Twitter and stuff, and I'm a believer. Oh. Uh, I, meant, I think I meant to say believer, but I'm a, but I'm a believer too, a Justin Bieber believer. Um, I think he's like the most kind of DevOpsy of like the teenage you know, entertainer kind of, you know, train wrecks. But, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a believer. I'm a believer uh, that there's a better way to do things. I'm a believer in DevOps. I'm a believer in teams. I'm a believer in collaboration. Uh, and I'm also a believer that you should ditch work if there's a really good powder day, um, like it was in this day. Um, so here are, here's some recommended hashtags. I mean, I can't like, you know, tell you exactly what hashtags to use, but like this, like if you are, if you happen to be tweeting about this session, um, there, might, there might be some good, good ones here. Believers for DevOps, 49 ums. I think that's, that's my allotted budget of ums for this talk. So uh, I think I have about 46 left. Um, if anybody wants to count, they're, they're more than welcome, welcome to. Um, so this is the introduction. Unfortunately, anyone who wanted to go faster, we're going to start uh, start the beginning, or at least where I think the be beginning is. So um, the TLDR is basically DevOps is awesome, and you should believe in it. But we're going to uh, get into it from the beginning. So who is this talk for? This talk is for anyone. This talk is for everyone. Um, this talk is for people who believe that there's a better way to do things, whether you're a, a project manager or an engineer or a CEO or, um, or a custodian or kind of whatever your title is. Um, this, this talk is for people who want to be agents for change within the organization and groups and teams that they're working for. Um, I want to believe. I am a believer. And if you guys don't believe that there's a better way to do things, I don't know how much I can help you. Uh, if you really don't believe there's a better way to do things, I think there's a session next door on why we should keep Drupal 6 forever and ever and ever uh, that might be more applicable to you at this stage. Um, uh, there's not, but there's going to be a good wake kind of funeral for Drupal 6 on Thursday I'm catching wind of, so I might try to hit that up. 
Um, so change agent, I kind of like that word. It sounds kind of badass, and it also kind of makes it sound hard, and it is a little hard. I found this diagram, which is, um, which you, it's like your own DevOps kind of change agent superhero, and you get to fill in, uh, fill in what your super DevOps superhero, um, kind of some of the things they might have in their utility belt. And while you're doing this, you can kind of think about what's in your, you know, what's in your DevOps tool, tool belt that, you, that, want, that um, you think will help you bring change to the table. So in this case, um, you know, um, our DevOps superhero has a burrito because DevOps is hard work and you might get a little hungry. Um, so you might need that burrito there. Um, uh, kind of an open hand to make sure you're kind of reaching across the aisle, meeting new people, giving high fives and celebrating your wins. Um, a fanny pack full of gifts because sometimes if you can't say what you really need to say um, in a gif or a meme, you know, maybe it just can't be said at all. Um, and, um, you know, a smile to make sure you're having fun, positive mental attitude um, to approach the, approach the uh, organizational problems you're looking at. So your DevOps superhero probably looks a little different than this, but, um, you know, I think you can be thinking about what, what you have and, um, you know, what your teammates have um, uh, and what you think will be necessary within the context of your organization um, to, uh, to kind of make some of that better way that you believe in a reality. Um, so why? Why should we DevOps? Um, you'll see I kind of make fun of the word DevOps, and I would encourage everyone else to uh, as well a little bit, turn it into a verb and different things like that. But why should we DevOps, right? Um, so this might be something that you kind of are tackling late at night as you can't sleep and you're wondering what the meaning of life and you know, how you're going to move forward and, and you know, what you were put here to do. This might be something you encounter as you kind of start to have some of these conversations within your organization, um, uh, a little resistance to change. And you can have, you know, there are a ton of different valid answers for this. Um, one being like, dude, because DevOps is awesome. And that might be applicable to your situation or, or something that you believe in. Um, uh, or more of the Jesse Robbins style, operations is a competitive advantage and we want to crush our uh, competitors. Um, it might be a little more refined, something like, well, do, doing a um, value stream analysis, we've identified um, a couple wastes, use, applying the, the system of the seven lean wastes, and we want to improve the cycle time and delivery time of our products. So you can come at this from a lot of different directions, but the nice thing that we all have in our back pocket is that if we don't change, um, ultimately we're all gonna be uh, beat out by people who are changing and organizations who are changing. Um, and so that's kind of a nice thing to know. Ultimately, the people who are resisting change um, uh, will, will find that change one way or another. So um, we had a couple hand raised about people who thought they you know, had a good handle on DevOps, but you know, not everyone in the room. So wanted to go into what exactly is DevOps. So these are a couple kind of marketing um, infographics, including, including one from Pantheon um, about what DevOps is. Um, and none of these really make sense to me. So the guy on the left has this really weird stance and he's kind of half and half. The people on the bottom don't have eyes, and not like that totally precludes DevOps, but I just don't really understand what's going on there. I think the photo on top, they seem to be having fun, which I think is a big part of it, so they're probably, like, that kind of resonates with me. And then there's, um, you know, the unicorn and, uh, and kind of pantheons over there. So I think there's all valid stuff here, but none of these kind of reach out and grab me and, let, like, um, are, uh, are the DevOps that I believe in. So then we can say, all right, well, what isn't DevOps? Maybe this is an easier, easier way to approach the problem. So uh, this is like the Docker GitHub repo, right? So DevOps isn't a single tool. Like you can't install DevOps. You can't like Git clone and like run DevOps, right? It's not about the tools. You know, this is a job description, or this is, um, this is like from another marketing website, I love New Relic, but, this, uh, but it's kind of easy to make fun of. So th these are their tools for DevOps, and this page just keeps going down and down and down. It's like every piece of software out there, everything is a tool for DevOps. And so maybe that's true, but I don't think we need a, a website for it. 
Um, you know, and a DevOps isn't a, isn't a role. You can't just kind of hire DevOps and make it happen. Um, although, um, you'll see a lot of these, and um, if you really feel like that's the best title for someone that you're hiring or in your org, uh, you know, go for it. Um, but none of these things, really, to me, are DevOps either. Um, so if we really need to pin it down and kind of put a definition on this. Um, I like this definition from Adam Jacob, who works at Chef. He's a really good hugger, and he's also put a lot of thought into DevOps and what that means and um, kind of wordsmith this pretty well. Uh, there's kind of a link on the bottom. Chef has a bunch of good content that actually does ring pretty, pretty true um, to me. So if you're looking for more info, look up kind of some of Chef's um, DevOps Kung Fu and, um, and uh, other content. But this definition is that DevOps is a cultural and professional fo uh, movement focused on how we build, operate, build and operate high-velocity organizations born from the experiences of its practitioners. Um, so I like, I like this definition. It actually kind of works for me. And I think the most, uh, the key piece that I like from this definition is the word movement. You know, and I think DevOps is about movement. It's about the movement of value from, real, uh, from ideation to realization. It's about the movement of organizational culture and norms from the status quo to the nouveau. It's about the movement of diffs and bits moving out from dev to test to live to customers. Ladies and gentlemen, DevOps is about movement. Um, yeah, that's it for this slide. Um, but you know, this is like, we kind of have to like embrace this, the paradox of duality here, dev and ops, and dev and ops, and DevOps. Uh, in the words of Zen Master Suzuki, they are one and yet not one. And I think if you spend enough time in DevOps, you, like, you might hear some people kind of get philosophical a little bit. I tend to do that, so you can kind of get me back online. But I think, um, <laughs> um, you know, so Suzuki talks about what it must feel like as a bit of water that's in a stream, and then the stream launches over a waterfall, and then it turns into these millions of little drops of water, and then they reunite all again at the bottom when the water hits the river again. And if you stare at this problem in the face long enough, you might start to look like this guy. Um, but you know, this is this is a hard, hard thing, um, hard thing to do, um, and even a even a hard thing to kind of think about sometimes. Um, but it's essential to DevOps that um, DevOps is never done. I like this quote from Damon Edwards. Uh, another um, gentleman who's kind of spent a lot of time thinking about this and working with organizations. Banish done from your vocabulary. You're never done. You're never done with DevOps. Just like Sisyphus was never done pushing this big ball up the hill over and over again, this big ball of DevOps. And I'm pretty sure the part of the reason you guys are in this room, uh, guys and gals are in this room, is that you're believers that there's a better way to do things and you're ready to take on the challenge in one form or another of bringing some positive change to your organization and your teams. And so you've already taken the first step, but this will be lots of work to roll this ball of DevOps uphill against all of the organizational, um, the kind of the status quo and the friction and the questions. Um, but I think that's why we're all here. There's a uh, French um, philosopher, Albert, Albert Camus, who did a treatise on the absurd when he was trying to wrap, wrangle his head around some of these dev, DevOps questions. And um, he came to the conclusion that absolutely the only way it works is that Sif Sisyphus was happy. He was delighted to have this uh, obligation to roll this ball, up, uh, up this rock up the hill again and again. And so I think like that happy Sisyphus, if you guys are looking to um, bring about change, um, you're going to need to kind of find your own zen and your own reason why these challenges are, are the right challenges to be fighting and bring that energy to the table every day. So how does one DevOps? We went over that we can't hire it, and we can't buy it, and we can't install it. So all that's really left is just to do DevOps. And the good thing is that the only thing you need to start doing DevOps is just to start doing DevOps. Um, and you're like, OK, OK, but really tell me, you know, we came here to get some actionable stuff. So I think that's 
probably the end of some of the philosophical DevOps stuff, but I can't guarantee it. It might pop up again. Um, so now we're going to kind of get, now with that out of the way, going to get a little bit more into the meat of the, <laughs> of the talk. Uh, so building your DevOps game plan. So here's this triumvirate of a kind of aspects of life, beliefs and behaviors and systems. And these govern um, a lot of the actions we take day to day, um, uh, how we interact with other people, um, even kind of the way we feel when we're doing our job or going about our lives. And these all are essential to building your DevOps game plan. If you master not one, but all three of these, you will be on your way to DevOps enlightenment. And we're going to dig in a bit. Oh, double animation, solid. Um, and so uh, beliefs and behaviors and systems are all kind of interrelated and inter interdependent. I kind of came up with this one uh, kind of set of relationships, but I think a lot of these are, um, there's a kind of a lot of different ways you could frame the relationships um, between these. You know, kind of the beliefs we have inform the behaviors and the actions we take every day. Those behaviors can get encoded in systems and kind of automated and systematized. And then those systems um, reinforce the beliefs that we had to um, be there, that we had at the beginning. And um, if you're not, when you're trying to approach uh, uh, organizational change, if, if you're not able to do that, um, if you're not able to change each of these, you're not going to be successful. And a lot of the, the uh, so excited about the DevOps track this year, um, I think there's a ton of great content. Um, but you know, I think in general, a, a bunch of the content kind of focuses more on the systems and the tools. And so um, uh, I'm helping to kind of round that out and make sure we kind of understand some of these other factors that are, are, are critical in um, achieving DevOps success. Of course, Gandhi, um, you know, Gandhi nailed DevOps um, with this quote um, when he's you know, talking about the interconnectedness of, of these different aspects, beliefs, behaviors, and systems, where your beliefs become your thoughts, your thoughts become your words, your words become your actions, your actions become your habits, your habits become your deployment tooling, and your deployment tooling ultimately becomes your destiny. Um, so I think I couldn't really say it any better than that. Um, yeah. So we're going to dig into each of these a little bit. So um, beliefs. Beliefs are interesting because one belief can inform you know, dozens or hundreds or thousands of actions you have. So beliefs are really a, a high leverage place to think about um, organizational change and, and DevOps in your organization. If you're able to identify those beliefs and, um, um, and kind of e either change them or, or even just understand them. You know, if you're able to change them, you'll able to be able to change the actions of you know many people and many actions over time. So it's a high leverage place to to focus um, kind of your energy. I think one interesting thing with beliefs is that they have an interesting relationship with uh, tr like um, truth and correctness. So beliefs can be absolutely true or absolutely false or probably true or probably false. Um, and it doesn't really matter. As long as someone believes something, as long as their, um, their kind of background and experience has led them that that's an important thing, that they believe in that, um, it doesn't even matter if it's true. For example, this guy hanging off a cliff, I'm not sure what he's believing right now. He might be believing this is remotely safe, not crazy. Um, he might be believing he's going to cling back to the rock. Um, but if I was in his shoes, I would pretty much be believing I was in a pretty tight spot and almost certainly going to splat shortly. Um, and so this quote um, about uh, what people believe to be true is, which, is that which is coherent to their already established cache of truisms. I like this because it kind of represented that, that uh, accumulation of experience um, leading, leading to a set of beliefs. I also liked it because it has the word cash in it. And as a nerd, that makes me think of like, oh, like my varnish cash or something like that. And we all know what happens with cached objects, right? Sometimes they get a little stale. They're not so relevant or fresh. And we, what do we need to do? We need to purge those caches, flush those caches. 
So we also have these like belief caches built up within each of us and even within groups of people. And sometimes, you know, we need it. We need to flush that cache. Um, <laughs> so behaviors, um, people are cre creatures of habit, right? You do an action a couple times, those become routine. Uh, routines become habits. Habits are hard because you don't really ever think about them at all, right? So they're not a place where you can kind of apply logic or something. They're almost kind of automatic. Um, they're hard to change. I think there's some good research that forming or, or um, destroying habits takes about like about 30 days of repetition. Um, and so that's kind of one of the things you're going to be up against is these behaviors and these habits that have built up with the team members and, and within the organization. Um, and that's kind of an uphill battle, um, especially attacking it on the behavior level. And then so the systems we have, the tools we have, this is super broad, right? This can be everything from the language that we use um, to the kind of, you know, the, develop, the tools we use to manage the development process, whether sprints or waterfall and all that, down to the kind of individual, I don't know, lines of code or libraries we use or anything else. And I think we're all familiar with um, the adage of if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And um, I think that's a really good um, um, explanation of why tools are so important. Uh, if you use tools every day or they're really familiar to you, they actually um, can really frame your understanding of the world around you in a pretty serious way. Um, so basically, we need to be attacking kind of all of these, um, all of these uh, different areas, beliefs, behaviors, and systems when we want to uh, introduce some positive change. Okay, so this is a little audience particip participation exercise. You don't have to participate, but I would appreciate if you did, and I'm gonna participate too. Um, so what do you believe that others don't, right? So these are kind of your differentiating beliefs. These are things you can leverage, because ultimately, um, the, you know, we talked about how belie uh, that beliefs are a, a high leverage place to focus, and if you're able to identify just some core belief you have that someone doesn't, um, you can use that to your advantage. Um, so these are some of the things I believe. Simple can be effective. You don't, it doesn't need to be complicated in a big workflow or something. You know, um, you know, have fun, are you doing it wrong? I think not everybody believes that, but that's pretty core to what I do, and a couple other ones. So the audience participation part now is that you pull out your smartphone, and you can either like Twitter or like email, and you can just like email to yourself, or, um, or your teammate, or your mom, or me. I'm nick at pantheon.io. And uh, just can just be in the subject or whatever, and you just say, um, just write down one belief that you have that other people, that not everybody shares. And this could be about DevOps or deployment or the comfortableness of the seat you're in or, um, or your feelings of uh, New Orleans or anything else. So I'm going to do this right now. There's no text in the subject. I'm going to send anyway. All right. Well, I'll let anyone finish up that's still doing that. Mine was that I believe this is going pretty well so far, um, better than I thought. Uh, and I hope you guys share that, but I'm not sure everyone else does. So I'm not sure how much I can lever leverage that for, um, for future wisdom, but, um, uh, but I think this is an exciting little exercise, and it just took 30 seconds in the middle of some talk at DrupalCon, and maybe you guys will hit upon a belief that is core to who you are and what you can bring to the table to, um, to uh, realize the positive future out there. Cool. I'm going to go quickly into some belief and behavior and system examples, uh, like from my experience, particularly Pantheon, and how these might constitute um, some challenges for, you know, basically a successful team. So what, one belief I held firmly, uh, you know, a couple years ago 
is that shipping rapidly is more important than shipping perfectly. Um, and I'm not telling you this is the right belief for you or this is a kind of a truism. We already talked about how beliefs um, have an interesting relationship with truth. Um, but for me at the time, this is a belief I held pretty dearly. Um, arguably, you know, maybe it was the correct belief at the time because, you know, Pantheon was, you know, just trying to, just trying to make it happen and just a couple people. Um, and uh, we didn't want the kind of perfect to be the enemy of the good. Um, but this affected Pantheon in pretty drastic ways. So this affected who we hired, um, what roles we hired for, and, and what kind of um, skill sets uh, we hired for, and what, what even, you know, hiring other people that believed this. Um, this affected how we, um, our project management tools. This affected our um, deployment strategies. This uh, affected, um, um, like, I think this is a good example of one belief um, determining the outcomes of many actions. Um, and so I'm not sure, you know, like, there's also the question of, um, is this the right belief for Pantheon at this time? You know, probably less so, certainly less so than it was a few years ago. Um, um, but that's where we were, and that did shape a lot of kind of who we are at Pantheon, but there's still room to change, and actually uh, need to change. Um, so I was thinking of this one. How many people like log on to a server and do pseudo sue ever? Right, and this is one of those ones that I think is a great behavior example because this just like flies off your fingertips. If you're used to doing this, it's like SSH pseudo sue bam, and you don't even, you're not, you're classically not thinking about what security you're kind of circumventing or you're not even thinking about security at all. It's just your fingertips like flying on the keyboard. Really ingrained behavior and habit. I do this with like a lot of command line stuff. If I'm like writing a blog post or like sending a text message or whatever, like if I zone out and zone back in, I'll, I'll just, the, my fingers will type ls enter. Like I'm, what directory am I in when I'm in like a Word doc or something, right? And I don't think I can ever really change that for myself and that's, you know, I don't think that's a terribly destructive behavior, but, but it is a behavior that's hard to change. And so, you know, early at Pantheon, it was like David and Josh and me and Ray, and like we'd, you know, log on, you know, we're like, didn't really have any customers, whatever. So we're like logging on, and you know, you log on, pseudo su, do some stuff on a server, try to move it forward. And this became a, a pretty, you know, kind of ingrained habit SSH pseudo su. Um, you know, then we hire a couple more people. Hey, we trust them. They're like, oh, how do I do this? You're like, oh, okay. You just SSH to the server. Oh, okay. Yeah, you, now you need a pseudo su. Just get, yeah, just get root and then, you know, go around. And then you know we continue to grow the organization and like kind of look around and we're like oh my gosh we actually not only do we have this behavior that's totally unthinking and is like kind of bypassing a lot of like good security practices which are like totally feasible um, in Linux and, and and whatever we've kind of trained like a bunch of people to do this really dumb thing um, and then when we had to kind of take that away um, you know it was it was. Uh, um, it was, that was a hard organizational change, you know, taking stuff away from people is always hard. Um, but I like this example of the behavior because some of the stuff you do on the command line or something, you're totally not thinking. Your fingers, you know, maybe you're just clicking your mouse or whatever in some web UI or just kind of flying through something and not even really thinking of the repercussions. And then worse, you're kind of like training up new people to do the same thing. Currently, nobody does this at Pantheon anymore. And then like a tools, uh, thinking of a good tools and systems example. So Pantheon is employees kind of all over the world and uh, France and Romania and Montana and Oregon and Minneapolis and San Francisco and Cape Town and Prague and New Zealand. Um, and so, you know, we believe that's an effective way to um, great, get um, kind of amazing um, uh, developer and engineer and otherwise uh, um, kind of skill sets and, and people on the team. Um, but there's a lot of friction in making that work. We have tried so many combinations of um, kind of SaaS tools and different microphones and wide angle webcams and like all these things to try to make it work. And we have a pretty good solution I can like share if you guys want later, but, but the experimentation isn't done, right? We've done expensive things like buy a robot where people can like tell it whatever, tell it in and like drive it around the office and stuff. Um, which is pretty cool, but, but um, doesn't get used a ton. We've done other like super cheap stuff, like 
in our slide templates where we know we're gonna have a bunch of remote people, we actually block out an area at the bottom that you don't put content in so that we can keep the faces up so you can see the faces of your like, remote team while you're, while you're kind of watching the presentation. Um, and so this is an example of how, just like the friction of like, you'd think this stuff is a solved problem, but it's definitely not. And um, this is something you need to kind of keep, you know, Sisyphus, keep pushing that AV, AV rock up the hill until you get it right. Or, or it's never done, right? Until you get a workable solution, move on from there. All right, so building your DevOps game plan. This is a quote from Eisenhower that I like to butcher. The one I like to say is, um, uh, plans are useless, planning is essential. And I guess this is what he actually, actually said. But it's important to talk about planning for a little bit. So if you, um, if you wanna just kind of break out your laptop and start devoping, like by all means do that. You know, you'll have some fun, maybe you'll install like some chef stuff or some like, you know, continuous integration stuff and it's gonna be awesome. But if you really wanna, and I think, you know, engineers and I'm an engineer and stuff, like, ah, that feels really good to like hack on stuff. But if you really wanna bring change to your organization, you're gonna need at least a little bit of a plan. Uh, and so that's what we're gonna go into. Of course, after you make that plan, as Eisenhower said, it's gonna be totally useless, but it's still essential or indispensable. So what makes a good game plan, right? It should be actionable, right? The goal is you're actually gonna act on this. It should be, you should be able to communicate it well, whether that's um, getting advice from people or sharing out to your team or, um, or getting to your remote employees you know, who, who, might, who might not be in the room when you're kind of developing these ideas. It should be adaptable to be able to change to the circumstances that arise. Um, it should encourage kind of long-term alignment, but also set some real goals. Notice that in your game plan, I didn't say anything about having um, the rock in it, or cute dogs, or people in tutus. And it turns out that was kind of a crappy movie anyway. But, okay, here it is. So, bam, pow, wowza. This is um, how we're gonna build our DevOps game plan. So this is kind of a, a modification of the Toyota Kata. Kata uh, is a word that's root meaning is basically a form, so this comes from martial arts. Um, it could also be for dance or cooking, or in this case, uh, an improvement theme on business processes. Um, this came out of uh, analyzing um, the Toyota production system, the precursor to lean manufacturing. Um, and so I think this is pretty genius. It's, and this goes back to like one of the beliefs that I hold is like simple can be effective, and this is really simple, and it can be really effective. It doesn't, you don't need some like complex plan. This is enough to get you going, and we're gonna dig into it a little bit. Basically has these four quadrants, and we're gonna go in it a little more depth on each one. Um, and if, uh, you're gonna need plans within plans. You're gonna need some big plans, some little plans. You might, you know, your big plan might be like, do DevOps and make awesome, and then your medium plan might be like, okay, reduce uh, kind of cycle time or delivery time to two weeks, and then your little plan might be like, oh, let's get our tests running in, you know, under 20 minutes instead of under an hour. So you're gonna need these kind of different fractal levels of plans. And now we're gonna deconstruct the kata a little bit and go into kind of each quadrant and how these can help you. So, um, uh, the top left quadrant, one of my favorite four quadrants of the Toyota kata um, is, uh, I like summarized as the now slash problem. So this helps you to find the problem space before thinking about the solution space. So we are all great problem solvers. A lot of us are paid to solve problems in one way or another, whether that's with code or um, people management or anything else. And one thing that, ha that uh, I think all of us fall um, prey to a little bit, and certainly me, um, is thinking about the solution and not defining the problem. So it's really critical in, the, uh, in the, this kata that the problem, the now slash problem uh, section, is separate from the solution. Uh, within your org, this is important because this helps kind of remove some of the emotion of this. So like if this was, you know, my um, kitchen counter at home, there'd probably be a lot of motion, emotions. There might be some words like totally disgusting um, and stuff like that. 
Um, and those same emotions are you know, present in the workplace. And maybe you can be like, all right, let's, okay, I, I get you are disgusted, but uh, let's, let's try to think you know, realistically here. What's the actual problem we're trying to solve? Um, and um, this also has a little hack that the sooner you start agreeing on stuff, as soon as you start agreeing on what the problem is, you've already kind of driven some level of alignment. Moving on to the definition of awesome. I can't remember, I think this is like Spotify's take or something on the kata, but I, I like these names. Um, so the definition of awesome is where you can think about the kind of constraint free, um, unbridled fantasy world, what this thing, how this thing would be solved. Um, this is this other little game I like to play here, which is like, how much can we agree about in 15 minutes, right? Don't worry about when you don't agree, worry about where you can agree and get as much of that down. This is vital, again, it's that hack where you start agreeing on something. And secondly, um, if you can all agree in this like far distant future of where you're going, you can kind of line up um, solutions and kind of implementations towards that. You know, if you think we're going to Australia and you think we're going to the moon and we don't understand that up front, um, we are probably gonna end up building different pedal-based solutions to get there. Um, yeah, and this uh, can be fun too, because you can say, no, 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 don't worry about those constraints. Don't worry about time. Don't worry about people. Don't worry about money. Let's just think about what, and what we really want here, if it was totally perfect. Um, so the next segment is the next target condition. So this is where we start to apply some constraints. This will change per organization. It could be, I think, a kind of good um, general rule is like, uh, although it totally depends, is like, is this gonna take like, like five people for five weeks is like kind of an amount of time that you could actually realize some real change. But it's really important that you get to a stable state, right? If Sisyphus is pushing that rock uphill, he's not gonna like stop on the super steep part where he could, if he like, like to stretch his back where the rock could roll down, right? He's gonna get it up to a little plateau and then, you know, take a, a uh, power bar goo and hydrate a little bit and then get ready to push back up. So I think these two things, one, really important to understand what a stable state is. Again, we never know what's gonna happen even with the best laid plans, but if we get our, you know, our technology or our process or our team or whatever it is to a state where it won't like, automatically regress if we can look away for a few minutes, that lets us be agile and kind of turn around and focus on something else that comes up if it needs to and not lose that work. Like the idea of conceivable effort you know, conceivable is like, can you actually kind of conceive of that in my small human brain? Like, yeah, five weeks, that's like after, you know, my wife's birthday or whatever. Like, yeah, okay, yeah, let's, let's give that a shot. Um, and again, the specifics of the constraints you apply will be uh, specific to your context and your organization. Bigger orgs, you might be like, hey, where can we get, in a, you know, a year? Um, other people might be like, hey, we've got two hours this afternoon. Let's see if we can, we can stable, st uh, get to a good state commit the code or whatever, um, agree on the change. Although you do, part of this is you do wanna break these up into like pretty small, like basically as small chunks as you can, um, just to reduce the risk of, of moving forward. You can always fall back to the definition of awesome, but you're focusing on the next possible stable state, basically. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about first steps. So what can we start doing right now? Um, uh, uh, that will help us start moving towards the next stable state, uh, towards the long-term long -term vision, just like this cute little duck waddling off into the sunset. I'll, I'll leave it with that for just a minute. You know they've proven that ducks are the funniest animals. And I think duck butts might then are even funnier. So there you have it. Um, this is the kata, this is the form that we're gonna put into practice and continue to kind of work with um, within our org and work through over time. Uh, reinvent constantly as needed. You're welcome to kind of like, this is a good starting place, you're like welcome to kind of tweak it as your, you know, as, as uh, your circumstances need, but this is the basis. So we're gonna go into some, um, into a couple examples and um, 
uh, there's a, like an opportunity for improv in here if anyone's really into improv, uh, or we can skip that, do that offline, get a boff. But, so we're gonna go through a couple of these. Doing the dishes, which is like one from my home life, you know. Um, uh, trying to get some po positive improvement there. Uh, looking at our on-call rotation, which is something that we're actively kind of discussing at Pantheon. Um, and, then, and then we'll see where we go from there. So, um, you know, okay, so my wife and I are like, okay. You know, she's pissed, it's disgusting. All right, let's define the problem here, okay. I totally agree, nobody could miss it, that the dishes are co covering the sink. Um, yeah, and the, and the um, utensils you know, are dirty. And she's like, and moreover, when I wanna go make cookies, I can't. And so now I kind of pick up, I'm like, all right, that's totally true, I totally agree, this lack of cookies is totally untenable. Um, and so then we're like, we're like, okay, agreed, boom. Let's go to, let's like, what would be awesome about, you know, our kitchen and our relationship with each other vis-a-vis -vis the kitchen? Um, we're like, cool, yeah, the pans are clean. Yeah, things are put away. Oh, that, because that makes, that makes, okay, we have, we can get homemade cookies pretty much any time in 38 minutes. Yeah, that would require like the, the cookies put away or the utensils like put in the right spot so we know where they are so we can streamline that whole thing. Okay, cookies in 38 minutes, that would be awesome. Um, yeah. And then, or like, okay, realistically, where are we gonna get from here? You know, this is kind of where you can break it down further. Um, uh, okay, so maybe we don't need, always need a new batch of cookies, but it would be, if we make a big enough batch, like we can always have cookies around. So I think that's like a pretty good stable state that like in our lives we just introduced that there are always these homemade cookies. And that will have like some backstop that like at least our kitchen operations are good enough that, um, you know, we're able to make a batch when we need to replenish the batch that um, um, somebody's gobbling on. Um, and so I think, another, like, I, I wasn't able to, like, really <laughs> manage it in this talk, but I think, you know, metrics, quantitative goals are really important. So, even, like, some of these will be qualitative, and that's cool, but as much as, like, quantitative goals and metrics as you can put in here, um, that really just, like, helps. That's another tool for alignment um, and probably worth a whole talk on its own. And then we're like, okay, getting into first steps, and I'm like, well, you know, I would, I, like, honestly, I would do the dishes, but... I don't like the way my hands feel when they're all like soapy and stuff. And we're like, all right, that's easy. Amazon, gonna get you some big um, gloves for doing all these dirty work. Kind of a couple other things. I have these big gloves. They're like so thick. I think they're from Japan and they're like fishing gloves or something, but they make me feel um, like, you know, um, I don't know, totally capable of, of getting in there. So that, um, boom, we're on our way. We have a plan. We've, uh, throughout this process, we've gotten a high degree of alignment on where we are now, objectively why that's a problem, where we want to go in the far distant future of our um, you know, uh, kitchen operating um, uh, vision. Um, we know we think we can get to a stable, uh, stable state, which will be um, easy to show whether we've made it there or not, um, as well as some, some first steps. Um, yeah. So the next one is a little more relevant like to work and stuff like that. But So we have this problem at Pantheon. We do have people all over, but kind of on the um, EU time zone, we have a lot fewer people. And so we have a lot um, fewer people there that in particular that are on the on-call rotation. Um, and then that's hard for them because they end up spending a lot of time on call. You know, we want to treat on call as a, as a top priority to make sure our systems are reliable and, you know, sites um, have the, the best uptime that we can manage. Um, but for this team in the EU, they're spending like an inordinate amount of time kind of being a little more reactive and not enough time being proactive. Um, we're getting more, we're, you know, hiring more and more great engineers. And um, so the rotation is getting bigger. Now we have like eight or 10 people in the rotation in the US alone, but that means the distance, the time between um, uh, when you're on call is, is spreading out. And so that means there's kind of less of a good feedback loop where we're actually able to fix problems and just end up kind of break fixing what we see. There's so much tribal knowledge. Um, so it's really hard to train new people on, um, on you know, what's a, what are the expectations and, and the tools and the tricks and the everything else that goes along with kind of debugging our production systems. Um, and so like as a manager, um, my team is kind of, you know, like I've only been a manager for a few years and um, uh, a couple times my team has very vocally kind of said, dude, um, 
you know, we're here to solve problems. You can't solve all our problems. And if you do, if you try, even though it looks okay here, like you're not gonna, we're not gonna implement the best solution that we have. Because we know a lot about this stuff because we're doing it day to day. So this is kind of a case where using the kata to help break out the problem space from the solution space and letting them handle that. Uh, working on definition of awesome, we have clear expectations about what's being on call. Uh, it's not relying on judgment, so that means kind of um, uh, our playbooks, anyone can follow a playbook. Like if it's your first day, you could be on call and still follow a playbook, and you don't need to know a ton of this stuff about how the system operates to be able to be effective. Uh, reducing the number of alerts. And, um, and I think you guys can kind of take away the rest. Um, so um, this is where I was gonna do the improv one, but I'm not quite sure we're up for it today. I don't think there's any huge improv fans, so you can go through this on your own. Um, and with that, wrap things up a little bit. Um, so hopefully I've convinced you, and I hope everyone here is in the room, you know, believes that there's a better way to do whatever it is we're doing. You know, we're excited and we're ready to be an active, fearless change agent within our team and organization. We have some tools now to help align on the kind of the um, collective vision and the future, uh, and we're gonna focus on some actionable next steps to deliver change. And lastly, but not least, uh, everyone here has to draw from, find and draw from sources of in inspiration. This is one of, it's one source of inspiration for myself. This is a picture of Franconia Notch in New Hampshire in the White Mountains. Um, and, uh, and this quote, um, always rising, never steeply. And um, this is something I've repeated, it's kind of a mantra for myself for a while. That you don't need to change the world in kind of big steps and bounds as long as you're getting a little bit better every day. And um, Jay Rayner Edmonds was one of the heads of the Appalachian Mountain Club um, towards the end of the um, 1800s who had this vision about recreation in, in the, these, these mountains, about creating a system of huts and trails that was always rising, never steeply. And in fairness, there's like quite a bit of steep stuff. Um, but I, this is always something I've been drawn to, to kind of wake up in the morning and um, get out of bed and you know, just try to make the world a little bit better of a place. One smile, one laugh, one shared goal, one act of collaboration. Um, yeah, so that's kind of what I'll leave you guys with. Um, and if you want more of this, another one of my D DevOps inspirations, Michelle, you can't say Krejci without CI. Krejci is talking Thursday um, about DevOps in the chocolate factory or something like that. Um, if anybody wants to rate me, I would appreciate the feedback and um, some other content that might help you guys. So thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Hopefully that was useful. Happy to dig into any questions or so are you still scared of DevOps in the back? I think he, we might have scared him out entirely, but yeah. Any questions I can answer? Or we can take them offline? Yes. The question was, can I back up a slide? Yes. <laughs> cool, thank you.